Okay, welcome back to our last sessions. We will have two more talks. They will be a little bit shorter. Uh, but what's special about this session is we will have two of our own, so to say. Uh, so first will be Veselin uh, Reitschev. He is a graduate. He got his PhD here at ETH in the computer science department. His research area in his thesis and also later in his work is machine learning for code, as he puts it, or machine learning to build smarter tools for developing code. And his thesis was quite a thing, so it won an honorable mention of the ACM Dissertation Award. So there's only one award given and one honorable mention, so quite a thing. And afterwards, he thought long and hard, should I go to academics or not? And in the end, he decided to co-found a startup, uh, Deep Code, and uh, stay in the Zurich area. So now you know. And that is also the meaning of his new company, where he works, SNYK. So now you know, that's the company that took over the startup. So without further ado, Veselin. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the nice introduction. Yes, so I will say a couple of things about Sneak, and actually one product of Sneak that's called Sneak Code, that is, as you can imagine, uh, based on the deep code engine that uh, was developed by our company. And so, yes, so that's, that's the slogan of Sneak, develop fast, stay secure. But so I'm going to say a bit more about how, how, actually, how actually this comes and then later on try to give a bit of demos, but I mean, you know with live demos anything can go wrong, so we're like looking for something wrong to happen. But so let's go, let's go now with the... So how things go. So as I said, things started at ETH Zurich as a research, and so we worked on a bunch of topics uh, then. So we did code completion, and uh, at the time, the best code completion out there was one of the ones that we have developed. In fact, maybe the first paper that does code completion with neural networks uh, was something we did. So we actually did automatic deobfuscations of applications, and that became quite popular and is actually still uh, having a lot of users. Uh, we can also reverse things like compilation, uh, so we can reconstruct debug symbols from binaries. So a lot of very various interesting things, but as you can imagine, something is missing, like there are no millions of users using that thing, so. Uh, it's all great, but that's what we would, that we would know. But so at that time there was a, DARPA Muse program that termed the coin Bitcoin, and so then came machine learning for code. That's a big thing. Uh, then after that came a EU project called Big Code, uh, where Martin is a principal investigator. And in fact, many large tech companies are doing research on machine learning for code. So now maybe people take it for granted that the Googles, the Facebooks, the Microsofts are having each, maybe around 100 people at least, working in that area, but like it started just 10 years ago. And then there were a few people doing this. And then we were looking at what we can do so that we get something useful, and then we looked, okay, so where do people spend their time? Do they spend their time in writing the program? Um, maybe no. Where do they spend more time? Well, it's actually maintaining old systems and fixing bugs, and so eventually that's where we went. We went after bug, bug finding, where most of the effort of the people would be spent. And uh, yeah, since 2020, uh, we actually joined uh, together with Sneak Code. Like Sneak has much better sales team. We have much better engine, and now uh, Sneak Code is a really a big thing, so going after it. So now, what is sneak code? Well, in fact, you put, you put code, and so there are ways to get code, and then in the case of people caring about security, they want to see a lot of, they want to see, if possible, all security bugs that are there in the code that they have written. And uh, in fact, sneak also has products that would find and tell you if you use open source libraries that have known security vulnerabilities or you use in your image that you are building and shipping in containers or something, if you, if you are including some known vulnerability uh, from, the, from the packages that exist in the image. But in the end, you also want to know if 
the code that you have written actually doesn't introduce a vulnerability. And now there are interesting things. So what do you want from this thing? Well, obviously, uh, I mean, there's no need to say to the audience here that you want very high precision, so you don't want false positives. Uh, that's good, uh, but so the other requirement that you actually have, and that's kind of important when we talk about machine learning, is explainability. So can I give a nice trace that says why this is a problem? Like if I would make a machine learning model, and this machine learning model tells me buggy code, how can I use it? Well, ideally I want the explainability of the systems that already existed before machine learning. Uh, so there is a third requirement that actually very few people talk about, and it's called detection. And that's uh, lack of false negatives. But so when people say lack of false negatives, they're usually in the, in the academic sense, it means I made some assumptions, and now under this assumption my analyzer is sound. But in reality, almost any analyzer just finds almost no bugs. So if you, if you take, like, the, like even the simplest commercial checker for code, it would probably find 10 to 100 times more things than Facebook infer. So um, try, to get, <clears throat> try to get detection. And so why is this the case? Well, uh, you have to check a lot of things. Uh, so it's not only... You have to have a lot of rules encoded into this engine. Uh, even, even for no pointer errors, you have to check under many kind of conditions under which this could happen. And finally, uh, of course, uh, what people care about is ease of use and speed. So can I, can I get it while, while I'm coding? And so, in fact, so I will not demo it too much, but so if you, you can just download an ID plugin. And then if you code, you would get, so that's, we scanned some pretty large project here. You don't have to do anything here. Just start coding, install the plugin. And as you code, eventually you will see some bugs being shown in that code. And so here you will also see pretty deep bugs in a way. Like it will tell you SQL injections and uh, uh, things that involve a lot of stuff uh, that probably, probably also has plenty of uh, so somehow the font is too small, but so, uh, I mean, you can probably see in our test example, we have thousands of them. But so the thing is, uh, there are many steps involved in almost all vulnerabilities going across small files and you get this real time. So uh, you don't need to use one of these analyzers that take hours to scan things. And so now I'll say a few things on how you actually get this thing to work fast and uh, what do you need to get it there? And so there are three topics I will touch. One is how do you use machine learning for bug, bug finding? So where is the whole area staying? Then the second thing is I'll talk a little bit about program analysis techniques. I mean, pretty simple things. And then how do you combine them with machine learning? So first, um, before like going on machine learning, let's say what are the models good for? Like what can you expect from a machine learning model? Well, if you go to the basics of machine learning, if I have some set of points in n-dimensional space, maybe text, maybe something else, like, uh, and I have some classification of these points, so let's say something that in my training data was labeled as good and something that was labeled as bad, so I can, I can run supervised learning. I can, uh, I can make a classifier that would start to distinguish the good from bad points. And so that's, that's the very classic machine learning. So things get better, of course, with neural networks and with pre-training and with text. So deep learning, what it can do is, first is it can make me to express very complex distributions of the data. So I can now be able to distinguish things that with old non-neural network models, they would have looked indistinguishable, like the model didn't have the capacity to do it. And furthermore, like deep learning can do knowledge transfer. Like, let's say I have learned a lot of things from natural language, probably I can transfer it to my code, and so maybe I can do magic things that would help me know what's the name of the thing that I see actually in the code or stuff like this. So this is 
this is what they're good for. And, but in the end, I need to get this label data. I need to get some, some supervised samples. And in the end, the model is as good as the data that I can get. And the tricky thing is data is very, very, very expensive to obtain. And so what do we have? Like if we want to get bugs, things look good on the surface, but they're probably much, much deeper than what you can, you can think in the beginning. So first, we cannot know all the defects. So let's say I have some code, and let's, let's say I'm looking for security properties of this code. I mean, even the possible security attacks are not known in advance, so new ones will be discovered at all times. Furthermore, uh, I mean, there is no great analyzer that already exists that would just tell me all the bugs of the known security vulnerabilities. So either they would over approximate crazily or uh, just not find enough bugs. Uh, and or probably not even be able to model the whole system properly. Uh, actually proving, uh, like I showed you the red samples, so it's hard to get the, the red samples, but finding the green samples is even harder. Like basically I have to have a program and I have to say for this program, this is bug free. Like have it and that's, that's good. And so now, as you can imagine, I can spend a lot of effort, uh, even money if you want to scale this. And then I'll get a handful of examples. Uh, so most people don't have this handful of examples. And even with very few examples, it's very unlikely that I can do anything. Uh, so, but the actual problem is, okay, I'll get a handful of green examples and a handful of red examples. The, will my classifier now classify half of the programs as green, half of the half as red? Probably that's not good. I don't know what is the desired distribution of what I'm looking for. I'm probably looking at some form of outliers, but I don't know how frequent they are, yes? The best thing, just a comment, do we really have any like a defect-free software? Defect what? Do we have any defect-free software? I mean, yeah, there is no, probably no such thing. Yes, but so eventually, eventually, there's the thing, I don't know the distribution, so I don't know what I'm looking for. And this makes the problem even harder. And somehow, it's, it's good to think from this perspective, like that we have to understand what the problem is before saying, okay, now I'm going to train this network with this data, with this. And so, actually, there are several, several works that do this, and uh, that try to find bugs. And uh, so the works are actually good. There is nothing against them. Uh, so what they're good, they do various technical contributions, and in the end they actually say also how well do they find bugs. And that's the good thing of them. So there is one work known as Debugs that trains on 50,000, uh, on, on 100,000 JavaScript projects, evaluates on 50,000 JavaScript problems, and finds 150 bugs in them. Actually, that's 150 reports in them. And around 100 of them are true, so it's like, like 60, something percent are good things, and 50% are false positives, like clear false positives. Now, the interesting thing is, well, there is ESLint, which is the thing that most people in the static analysis community maybe would not even consider a proper static analyzers. And then on this thing, it would find seven million reports. And so now you would say, well, are these seven million reports somehow more stupid than these 100? Somehow, I don't know they tell me something obvious that doesn't need any analysis or anything. Well, no. In fact, many of these are much smarter than the things we're looking at here. Like here we're looking at maybe some style not being great and so on among these 100. So it's not like 100 very deep bugs. It's like 100 trivial things that an, an easy checker on ESLIN detects as well. Uh, but that's not this. So, I mean, this, is, this uses uh, not the latest and greatest transformer neural network. So there is one that uses the latest and greatest tra transformer neural network. And so the authors have looked at the top 100 reports that this produces, and there are around 19 true problems. And when I say true problems, again, it's a bug, maybe in the unit test, maybe in something, so it's not, but 19 of the 1,000 are true reports. So they're like, Completely unacceptable precision, also basically no, no reporting capability in comparison to the old fashion tool. And 
Unfortunately, that's, the, that's roughly where the state of the art is. So we also have some works in that area. They go a bit higher on the number. But I mean, we didn't write in the paper that ES Lint totally kills us. But it does. So um, that's the sad reality. So now, state of the machine learning for fun. Of course, it's very easy. Like we, we tested against Facebook in fur, and we built it in Facebook in fur. So now we go on machine learning. And so if machine learning can find 100 bucks, and ESLint can find 7 million bucks. So how big is the gap like? What can we do? Uh, and actually, first, is there a gap like? And there is one thing I did is I went over this 100 bucks and, well, there is nothing new among them. It's like all of them are subset of ESLint. Nothing, really nothing is there. So is there anything we can do? And yeah, so there are stuff that we can do. So let's look first what is, what is there, like what's the problem and uh, why, why are these just, I don't know, why are just throwing this model is not finding bugs? Uh, so let's look at program analysis techniques. And so let's look at what a vulnerability looks like. So that's Python code, kind of simplified, Flask. Uh, some things are missing, so people that know Flask will see that some things are not quite there, but that's kind of simplified. And this one has a path traversal vulnerability. So it means that somebody may pass a file name as input parameter to this uh, web server that is being served by this Flask code. And they can pass such a value in the, in the, as the file name in the input, basically in the, in the HTTP request that they send to the server. And if this server is running in the directory called var www up, they can go and they can access some other file on the file system that's not in this directory. So for example, the password of the server. And then they can actually even pass uh, the content of that file to be overwritten. So after they do this, of course, the server belongs to the hackers. So that's, that's how a vulnerability works. Right? works. Uh, so how are we going to analyze it? Well, usually we do some kind of data flow graph. So we go after, we try to model what's happening here. And so I, I made this simplified data flow graph. So basically data comes from this file name. We do OS path join after that at the second statement. And finally, I say flask request file safe. And when I have this, uh, we're, we're looking for this bad flow that starts as source, basically something that the user can control, and ends in a sync, basically something that's security dangerous. And if there is such a flow, then um, basically my application is vulnerable to path traverse or vulnerability. Uh, and how the fixed code looks like, so when I make a classifier or something that would make the fixed code, well, I would add some function in between called sanitizer, that will look and, for example, remove the dot dots from the input file name that's given to me so that nobody can actually execute the path traversal vulnerability. And so the data flow would look something like starting from the source, things would go through a sanitizer, and so this means that there is no data flow, that, that there is no unsanitized data that can go from the source to the sink. So this code then should be safe from path traversal vulnerability. And now it's natural that these things would be described. Uh, I mean, you have a lot of things to check into in, in, this, in this way. And it's kind of natural that you would want to have a declarative language uh, that would let you describe what you want to check so that you can make many more checks so that you can check for hundreds of properties and so on and so on. And so, for example, we want to have some language with which I would say, well, if something is called, just, just as an example, of course, that's not, that's not the best example. That's not the best thing. But if something satisfies regular expression dot star file name, I'm going to call it a source. <coughs> or if something is called os.patcolonicalized or vertize secure file name, I'm going to call it sanitizer. 
And so I have such rules that now can tell me for each node in the graph when would it be source, when would it be sanitizer, when would it be sink. So these rules now I have to write, and now I have to give to hundreds and thousands of security researchers, developers, and so on, that would find such rules and write rules and do things and so on and so on. So that's all great. Uh, but so once I have it, uh, that's a pretty standard thing. I don't expect that there is anything complete, anything new here. So I have to do a data log program that would basically check if there is a vulnerability. So I will write this program for one very specific reason, because I'll show you how simple that program is. So I will write, a, I have a predicate source, and so it's basically true only for this node. I have a predicate sanitizer that's true for this node, and I have a predicate sync. And then in data lock, and I assume everybody knows data lock, uh, I will say something is tainted. So that's a like, logical expression. Something is tainted if it's a source, or if there is data flow from another node Y that's tainted. And so that's recursive. So eventually, this will be tainted. And over in the fixed point, I will find out that every single node here is tainted. <coughs> something is vulnerable if it is sync and it's tainted, so, uh, so it's written here. So then here I find a vulnerability, and I have the node in the graph on which this is going on. Of course, I, I simplify this a bit more. Something is tainted, of course, if it's also not sanitized, so I can have negation. This is completely fine for stratified data log because sanitizer is known in advance before computing tainted, so it's called, called, called in an earlier stratum. So if I fix this program to have not sanitized, I'll find that there is no vulnerability in this program. So this is all, this is all great. <coughs> and so that's, that's how I can find if there is any vulnerability. Now, note something very interesting, because I have seen a lot of programs that do taint analysis. Every relation that I have defined is unary. And many, many, many programs don't do this, but so you can do it. That's the, that's the cool thing. Some of, the, some of the input relations are binary. I have somewhere edges in the graph, but they're input, so I'm not computing new edges. And so what we do is we actually made a language with which one can describe such kind of vulnerabilities. And we can kind of separate the concerns. So the people that are doing security research, they can work in that language. In that language, every predicate is unary. It's impossible to write a slow query because if I have everything unary predicates, I can do bit sets for all operations and everything. Whereas the program analysis, I mean, it goes, it goes to people that can do program analysis. And so at this point, now you can actually get this kind of detection as well, also by definition. <coughs> so how, how the language works? So we call it Starlang. And so the way it works is like fairly simple, you define predicates, and for the for the predicates you say basically when they hold. So if, and then you can put several conditions under which it would hold. Uh, if you put multiple ifs, it's or. If you put multiple things in the same if, it's and. So fairly fairly simple, uh, just syntactic sugar over data lock. But now the cool thing is we actually define something called templates. And the template is exactly what you would imagine a template does. So it's like when you call a template, just like maybe in C++ template, you have a parameter. I say this has one parameter. And whatever was the fastest parameter of the template is replaced here. And then I define new predicate. And so I can do things that otherwise I would have done with non-unary predicates, with unary predicates just by instantiating more templates. And so that's that's the whole magic. So now if I have a tain vulnerability, it roughly looks like I define a predicate for source, I define a predicate for sync, and I have this template that will tell me how do I recursively have, have the data flowing from the source into the sync. And of course, I light a bit. It's a bit more complicated. I, I want the unsanitized tain flow from, so it's a template on two arguments. So now if I have this, I have to replace, of course, with predicate for source and predicate for sanitizer. And uh, now I can, I can do uh, this kind of stuff. And I can do uh, pretty complicated queries. And everything would work basically instantly. And so one thing that you can do is you can, you can even, so 
if you have some code, so that's for example some Python slash code, I can do, I can use this language, I have templates, in fact I have, I have even some pretty nice uh, templates that would give me the whole 10 vulnerability. As I look at 10 vulnerability, that's how the source looks like. Uh, so let's say I look at SQL injection, so there I put SQL injection sanitizer, SQL injection sync, uh, and so that's the standard query that I would do that would find SQL injections. I can change, I can say, okay, maybe, I don't know, I can, instead of using the, instead of finding every SQL injection, I will find only the ones that call the method execute, or I need to know that the values that I'm looking for, I have to quote, and then that's how it works. So it's instant search in your code base. You can do pretty complicated things. I can, for example, only look at, I don't know, so it has, it has some built-in templates. I can say, for example, is, I don't know, if, if it's the second argument of execute, only then it would be a sync. And so now, as you can imagine, if I run this, it, not, it would not match on this example because I have execute and that's not the second argument. But if I would put the first argument, then it would match. So, uh, pretty advanced, at the same time pretty easy to use. So, how do we go? So that's what we get. Now, what I'm not going to say is how are we going to build the graph for the query. Well, that's a complicated thing, but it's another, it's another data lock solver entire that we have built. We, we build this graph in a super precise way, like very, very high context sensitivity, flow sensitivity, field sensitivity, basically everything that you can get. And it works very fast, basically works faster than what you would get if you just drop all of these from other analyzers. Um, so no time to go over this, but that's how it goes. And so how do we combine it with machine learning? Well, we have, the way we have found to be good is that we would use the machine learning as specification. So if you think of that data log program, I have ground facts for this data log program, and these are the ground facts that I will learn from, with machine learning. And then after that, I will run the data log program, it will do data flow analysis the way we know it, and uh, everything would work as expected. But uh, what, we will, what I will get is still uh, the explainability and I would find a lot more issues than I would find if I didn't do any machine learning. Of course, why does it work? Well, because in reality, programs uh, use a lot of frameworks, they use a lot of APIs, and so all of these APIs, sometimes you won't have the code for, or even if you have the code for, you cannot model them precisely. So what do we do? Well, we have a, we have a technique that we will do. So essentially, we have static analysis. It gets the data flow graphs. And what we want is we want to know whether things satisfy certain predicates, sources, things, sanitizers. But we will learn from code how does it work. So we do it by encoding beliefs. So we basically say certain things that we believe hold for most of the code out there. So for example, if there is code which has sanitizer and sync and data flow going into the sanitizer and then into a sink, and then I don't know where it comes from, well, most likely, some of the methods it comes from is a source. And so in the same way I can do for sanitizers and sinks, so I can, the interesting thing is I can describe this knowledge that I have as linear equations. And so, in fact, they're integer linear, but you can go with the non-integer relaxation and everything works fine, it just gives me probability of something being source or something being sanitized or something being seen. So that, that, was, that, that was a paper we published at PODI 2019. So you can probably ask uh, one of the main authors, Victor, who is uh, here in the audience, a bit more details for how it works. But so in the end, we get this huge number of constraints. We solve these constraints, or we've solved them softly because obviously sometimes there will be buggy code. Um, so we basically put slack variables and then we optimize with the slack variables. And then in the end what we get is we get specification that, will, that tells us a lot of APIs that we didn't even know could have existed. And now it tells them this is sanitizing or this is a source of user data or this is executing SQL statements and so on and so on. So overall in the end, this is, this was in the paper, but overall this is pretty well integrated also in Star One. So 
I define my predicates, and it has this nice thing where I would say, well, learn here, and then after, after the machine learning goes, it actually fills in the predicates with hundreds of things that I would not have found otherwise. So yeah, uh, with this, I'm happy to take some questions. Yeah, thanks for that talk. So how does um, the work you just showed us compare to, uh, compare to ESLint? To what? To ESLint. Oh, yeah, that's, uh, it compares pretty well. So ESLint cannot find any of the complicated bugs that this finds. Basically, ESLint cannot find any security bugs, really. Okay. I do it in my... And in terms of number of findings, there are a lot of findings. So. Oh, thanks. This is super cool. Um, I just saw one bullet flash by during the talk that mentioned you had to extend your data log engine yes. uh, to support scaling. Uh, could you just comment a little bit about what optimizations were helpful in the data log engine to, to scale this, in, this uh, so analysis up? We have a different decision procedure. Uh, basically, if you take souffle, it's around 100 times slower than what we do. Is it secret sauce, what you did inside? Uh, uh, yeah, for now. <laughs> uh, 100x on souffle, though, is very impressive. That's cool. Uh, hey, thanks for the talk. I, I have just one question. Um, what is the the limit of the? I mean, it relates a little bit to to the to the data log graph that you're building. The, the yes. step that you skipped. What are the limits of the bugs that you can find on the one hand, and uh, are there any interesting bugs that? Um, you cannot catch. Yes, that are outside. Yes, so a big, big, I mean, the question is because uh, yes. with data look, you can. Yes, yes. So the first thing is when we when we define Starlink, we defined it. We made a very very strong restriction on the data lock engine there on on what queries you can do. Basically, we said you can only write unary predicates. And so now, if I want to check, are you using are you passing the same value as the second argument and the fifth argument of a method? Now that that doesn't go directly in the engine. I mean, I lied a bit. We actually have an, an S, a, a SAT extension of the, of the, the star rank where you can, you can do such checks, but that's a, that's a real limitation. So these things work, work slowly, so we, don't, we probably don't want to put them in the publicly accessible star rank language because we want anything you write in star rank to be instantly executable. So if you want to, to do such things, like am I passing the, second, the same value as fifth and second argument of a um, Function you cannot write it in Star Wank, but you can do a lot of bugs even without this. So uh, like all the types, type state, safety bugs, everything can go there. What you cannot do also is buffer overflows. Uh, generally, if you have to do arithmetic comparison, so we don't have an arithmetic engine, so that that one would not be great for us. Leslie, thanks for the very nice talk, nice work, cool work. Two questions. One is, for the sanitizers, do you assume every one of them to be correct if it's used? The second is, do you model conditionals in the code? Yeah, so for the second question, I do not understand the first, but for the second, we model conditionals, and so for the conditionals, we put special edges in the graph. Okay. So the, the, I didn't describe all the edges that you have in the graph as input. But some of them are conditional. So the whole engine in the end is very, very precise okay. from program analysis perspective. That's right. yeah, for, and, for the... and in the graph, it already handles cases where it would figure out that some, some conditions would never be true or things like this. Okay. And that's the best effort, I assume. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's part of how we build the graph. After that, you query the graph with Star Wars, just as usual. OK, so the first question was, uh, you know, you can have like many sanitizers in the code, yes. and uh, the question is: the sanitizers can also be buggy. Do you yes. assume that every sanitizer, if an input is going through a sanitizer, then it's properly sanitized? That's oh, some. Okay. So now, uh, if if we if we detect that something is a sanitizer, we would basically we would not find the report. Now. There is another product in Sneak that would check the open source library 
It doesn't, it doesn't have known vulnerabilities, and basically wrong sanitizers are known vulnerabilities in open source libraries. Okay, last question. Former advisor. Yeah. <laughs> so can you give like a bit of insight, like why is this machine learning, purely machine learning, so bad at bug finding? Is it, I mean, we're trying to understand it, but what's, the, what's your thoughts on this? I mean, there's hundreds of papers on this, like uh, neural nets, bug finding, and all this. But like, why are they so? Why is this like gap happening like this? Because you can potentially take those rules and learn a machine learning model to, like, take supervise, super supervision data set and supervise data set, and then learn, try to learn a model. Like, why is they so bad like this? What's the fundamental reason of this massive gap? Yeah. So. To me, it is the fact that just data is so costly to obtain that almost any any proxy for this data is also pretty bad. Like if I would try to think, well, let's let's find correct code and introduce bugs. So this introduces very very serious distribution shifts that you would not be able to recover. So, that, so this doesn't give again what the real distribution of the bugs would be. So. I don't know, it's, it's an interesting research topic for what would happen, but uh, I'm not very hopeful uh, on this. I would be more hopeful on machines writing correct code from scratch than on this. Okay, thank you. Let's stop on this hopeful note. So <laughs>